you have mutually exclusive concepts there. Is the concept of a maximally great being incoherent? Stephen Woodford, also known as Rationality Rules, thinks so. On April Fool's Day, he and Alex O'Connor discussed Alex's conversion to Christianity. I don't know why you're laughing, like, this is I, really serious yeah, stuff. Sorry. Alex was playing the devil's advocate and argued why he believes that Christianity is true. They discussed the ontological argument and Stephen argued that the concept of a maximally great being has mutually exclusive properties and therefore the concept is incoherent. In this video I show you how the cross of Jesus Christ is the glorious solution to the problem. Welcome to my channel. My aim is to help you see and defend the truth of Christianity. So what can we say about the greatest conceivable being? Well, it isn't just very powerful, it is maximally powerful. So this being must be omnipotent. It doesn't just have a lot of knowledge, but maximal knowledge, so this being must also be omniscient. It is unlimited in space and time, so it is omnipresent and eternal. And finally, this being must be morally perfect. According to Stephen, this last attribute is incoherent. Your concept of the greatest possible being would express his omnibenevolence with pure justice. Mm -hmm. So he will say, look, um, it's always an eye for an eye. I'm never going to take a tooth for an eye. Like, justice is enacted. That is what I'm always going to do. My concept of the greatest possible benevolent being is one, let's say, in contrast, that has maximal mercy. So I think that he shows mercy whenever he can. Mm -hmm. So it's not an eye for an eye. You have mutually exclusive concepts there. Alex tries to give the Christian answer to this question by saying that a perfect being would perfectly balance these properties. Even though humans are unable to know where this perfect balance is, that does not mean that there isn't a perfect balance. Of course, there's yeah. going to be an epistemic problem here that we yeah. don't know whether it's going to be justice or mercy and mm -hmm. what the balance is going to be between the two. Mm -hmm. But if there is such thing as objective morality, which mm -hmm. we can get to later, mm -hmm. then, but which at least you'll understand the Christian will accept, then there is a right answer to that question. And the maximal, maximally moral being will just have whatever the correct answer is to that question, right? Yeah, I, I don't buy that. I understand, Stephen, because whatever the balance is, God on this view does not have his moral attributes to a maximal extent, since they must be balanced. This means that we can imagine a being who has some moral attribute to a higher degree than God. We could, for example, imagine a being who is more merciful than God, namely a being who is maximally merciful instead of a being who is sometimes merciful. The question is, is the concept of a being who is maximally just and maximally merciful really incoherent? On the surface this seems to be the case, because whenever you punish someone you are just and not merciful, and whenever you pardon someone you are merciful and not just. What I find remarkable about the seeming incoherency in the character of a morally perfect being is that the core doctrine of the gospel solves the problem. It is called penal substitution. Penal substitution is the doctrine that God inflicted upon Christ the suffering that we deserved as the punishment for our sins as a result of which we no longer deserve punishment. The Bible says that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Since a just God cannot turn a blind eye to our sins, He must punish. At the same time, a merciful God wants to forgive sinners. This is the reason why God became a man and died on the cross. On the cross, divine justice was satisfied because Christ bore the punishment that we deserve. God didn't sacrifice His justice to His mercy or vice versa. Instead, he sacrificed his son as a propitiation for our sins. Propitiation basically means the appeasement of God's righteous anger. This is achieved by Christ on the cross because he was punished in our place. This was an act of divine justice because the entire debt was paid, but also an act of divine mercy. Because anyone who will accept this free offer and puts their trust in Christ will be pardoned and receive eternal life. This is why the Bible calls sinners who put their trust in Jesus justified. Christians have been made legally just because their sins have been imputed to Christ. And Christ's righteousness has been imputed to them. Imputation is making someone liable for something that he didn't do, as if he had done it. Christ was made liable for our sins. The Bible says it like this. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. All people are offered a pardon for their sins. This is a legal act that removes the liability of the criminal. This is pure mercy because none of us deserve it. And this is freely offered to us all. But this pardon is also pure justice 
because it is based on Christ vicariously taking our sentence and thus fulfilling divine justice. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time, so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So, to conclude, Stephen is wrong that maximal justice and maximal mercy cannot coexist in one being. The Gospel gloriously demonstrates God's moral perfections. Jesus, the God-man, took away the sin of the world by suffering terribly on the cross. This is an act of divine mercy. At the same time, God's righteous anger was appeased because the punishment that we deserve fell upon Christ. This is an act of divine justice. The prophet Isaiah said it like this 700 years before it happened. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. No other religion can give you such a satisfying and glorious solution to the seeming incoherency in God's perfect character. There is no balance between God's justice and mercy. They are both maximally displayed in Christ who bore our sins on the cross.